How do we define justice? In a secular nation, where do religion and law intersect? Is there tension between empathy and reason in legal thought? Philosophers have long pondered such questions, and they are raised every day in the courts of law. As part of our Renovatio conversation series, we've asked two lawyers and thinkers, John Eisenberg and Mutnis Tome, to discuss these issues in the unique context of both constitutional and Islamic law. John Eisenberg has practiced law for nearly four decades, argued a dozen cases in the California Supreme Court, and dealt with civil rights cases involving same-sex marriage, the right to die, affirmative action, religious liberty, and detention at Guantanamo Bay. Motnis Tome is an attorney specializing in intellectual property law and has also studied classical text in Arabic and Islamic law with scholars in Mauritania. He has taught Islamic legal theory and American constitutional law in Saytuna College. Um, okay, good morning. Good morning, John. Good morning, Munez. Uh, nice to, to have you for this conversation. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, uh, so as a civil rights attorney uh, and as a constitutional uh, appellate attorney, which I'm sure as an appellate attorney who deals in constitutional questions, um, justice is probably something that, that you know, you deal with a lot. Um, in, the, in the Quran, there's an exhortation that uh, do not let the wrongdoing of a people cause you to serve, fr- swerve away from justice. Uh, be just, that is, closer to God consciousness. And we also have in the you know, U.S. Constitution, as an example, uh, in fact, the word justice doesn't show up in, in the meaning of being just and so on and so forth. It doesn't really show up except for once in the preamble, we the people of yes. the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, et cetera, et cetera, do ordain and establish the Constitution of the United States. And, and so... Uh, you know, there's there's kind of these references to justice, but I and and I think justice gets embodied both in in the um, in Quran uh, as well as the U.S. Constitution in terms of specific prescriptions. Um, you know, uh, you you should do this, you should do that. There's the equal protection clause. There's uh, you know a just compensation clause. These types of things where justice is is you know, sort of examples of justice are, are uh, specifically provided for. Um, but, you know, as a general term, I think it's, it's, it's a difficult thing to define. And I'm just wondering, you know, since a lot of your career and a lot of your work has been related to pursuing justice um, and doing what is just, what, how do we define justice? I mean, I think one way people often talk about justice is that equal protection of you know, clause type of justice. You know, it's fair to treat all people equally, but in some situations, you know, justice seems to require, uh, at least according to some, uh, treating people differently. You have affirmative action as an example. Um, you know, there was the Violence Against Women's Act, uh, which targeted violence against women. There's hate crimes where um, vandalism, which would normally be just vandalism, actually gets elevated uh, because hate is involved. So that you know, the same act of vandalizing someone's property or saying something to somebody um, changes it. Uh, so, so you know, how do you define justice? What, where do you think you know, uh, equal, unequal, these types of ideas? How, how, how do we pin down what justice is? Well, you're right. The Constitution mentions it once in the preamble and never mentions it again. So what can we look to in the Constitution that tells us what justice is? And I think the best we can get from the Constitution is in the Bill of Rights and the various amendments since then. Uh, You mentioned equal protection. That, coming through my copy of the Constitution here, the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment says no state shall deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. That is a fundamental notion of justice embodied in the Constitution. Note, though, that it was not adopted until 1868. That's a long time since the adoption, the original adoption of the U.S. Constitution in 1789. It took uh, 79 years to get the Equal Protection Clause. Um, 
other rights guaranteed by the Constitution are, for example, in the First Amendment, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So you might say justice is, includes, uh, respecting one's right to practice one's faith without burdening somebody, without burdening, burdening the people with uh, imposition of the establishment of a state religion. Uh, you look at the Fifth Amendment. No person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. That's justice. Uh, mm -hmm. You may not be incarcerated unless you have not just done something criminal, but uh, been held account held accountable for it through due process, through a fair procedure. So in my work as a practicing lawyer, I, I never taught constitutional law. Um, I've experienced it in practical application. And what justice means to me can be rather elusive. But I look to various provisions in the Constitution and particularly in the amendments of the Constitution to tell me what the broad general outlines of justice are. Yeah. Uh, in, in application, that can get pretty difficult because, as you mentioned before, with, with reference to affirmative action, for example, sometimes uh, dispassionate objective equality might not necessarily achieve justice. Uh, so there is a lot of wiggle room. And I, the Constitution is sometimes described as a series of chapter headings, and it's up to the U.S. Supreme Court and the lower federal appellate courts and state courts to uh, to write the, the chapters. <laughs> and things change over time, and sometimes the legislature. Well, so you, you gave some examples. You know, I, I can think of confrontation clause, you know, uh, due process clause, um, those kinds of specific examples. And um, I, I wonder whether, you know, for example, in the case of affirmative action, what's the specific example that in the Constitution, and, I, and I'm not sure it's there, but I'm wondering whether you have any ideas. And that's, that's where extra textual interpretation is, is something that's important, I think, when dealing with the Constitution or even with, in the Islamic uh, texts. I, uh, there is a principle uh, called... Uh, Masalih Mursala, which means un, un, uh, untextually defined uh, um, uh, benefits or, or um, values or virtues. And uh, it's a recognition by certain, some scholars say there is no, I mean, you know, the kind of the sort of Scalia and sort of uh, Breyer sort of debates that we have here in the United States. I mean, they, they exist in the Islamic law world as well. I mean, you, you do have scholars in the Islamic tradition who deny any extra textual um, mm -hmm. virtues or values. It, it's all in the text. And if it's not clearly derivable from a textual provision, sort of, um, you know, references to, to induced, you know, or kind of like the penumbras that are, that are mentioned in uh, Griswold, uh, that that sort of thing is suspect versus other scholars who said no. You know we can we can try to understand the the technical meaning of certain provisions in the text uh, in the Islamic texts, but we can also um, extract from those and infer from them higher other principles. Um, and so I wonder whether, given those specific examples you gave, is there for something like affirmative action where you're going to deal with people unequally? Um, is there a textual provision we can we can uh, sort of point to, or does that require sort of like an extra textual interpretation? Well, it requires uh, some broader look at the world outside in law, outside the 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 text of the Constitution. Yeah, we have the Equal Protection Clause, eighteen sixty eight, saying no person shall be deprived deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, 1868. Compare that with Article I, Section 3 of the Constitution itself, <clears throat> which addresses uh, representatives in Congress in taxation. And it says that the number of representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the states, 
uh, and the apportionment, this is a quote, and it's still in there, shall be determined by adding to the whole number of free persons, including those bound to service for a term of years, and excluding Indians not taxed, and three-fifths of all other persons. That's a notorious clause, three-fifths of all yeah. other persons. All other persons means slaves. And what this meant was that during the, uh, the uh, slave-holding era, when the Constitution was adopted, the southern states were given representation to account for their slave holdings, uh, but each slave counted as three-fifths of a person. That's not really equal protection. So when decades later we get a guarantee of equal protection, what does that mean? Do you not look at the previous decades of unequal treatment? Do you not look at the decades of unequal treatment or centuries. after? <laughs> Yeah, you know, centuries. Centuries. Yeah. centuries. I mean, even since the uh, the uh, 14th Amendment, eventually we had Reconstruction, the history of uh, Reconstruction of the Union after the Civil War, but eventually the Jim, Jim Crow laws came into effect, and we had Plessy versus Ferguson toward the end of the 19th century that said, uh, that, that enshrined in law the notion of separate but equal treatment, separate but equal being an oxymoron. So we have this debate today about affirmative action and something John Roberts, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, said in 1907, uh, he said, the way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. Yeah. Sounds simple. Uh, I don't yeah. think it, it's not that simple. One does not erase decades or centuries of unequal treatment just by saying we're going to stop. Yeah. So then the question becomes, what can we as a people, what can our legislature, Congress, state legislatures do to remedy the unequal treatment? There's a maxim in the law of equity, generally. You know, Islam has its maxims, and so does uh, Anglo-American law. And that maxim, it's actually embodied in civil codes throughout the country. In California, it's set forth in civil code section 3523, and it says, for every wrong, there is a remedy. Uh, and I imagine that uh, that notion is to be found throughout the three Abrahamic faiths. For every wrong, there is a remedy. Is the remedy for decades, centuries of discrimination just to stop discriminating? I don't think it is. It's not enough. And certainly in the United States, we're to this day roiled by uh, racial divides and uh, continue to be. And the country is still struggling with the legacy of slavery. Yeah. No, I think that's that's very interesting. I mean, I, I, I think in the Muslim community, um, we have the same difficulty uh, of textualism versus, you know, understanding context. Um, you know, one of the five maxims of Islamic law is uh, uh, custom uh, shall be given the force of law. And I think a lot of times, uh, you know, uh, people interpret this, uh, the, this phrase custom to uh, be very limited to uh, just the way people do things. Like, for example, we have in contract law and Anglo-American law that prior, cust prior um, um, that custom can be used to explain the terms of contractual terms. You'd look to custom. So, for example, if there's a famous case, if you, uh, you know, I'm sure different case books uh, uh, show this idea in different ways. But the, in my, when I was in law school, the case we studied for this was the case about chickens. Oh, yes. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, the famous case about chickens. And, you know, that someone had ordered chickens and, uh, you know, X thousand pounds or something like that. And what they got delivered was stewing chicken. And, and they wanted fryers. And, and they wanted frying chicken. And, and they said, you know, yes. in, in the poultry industry, in the, you know, grocery business or whatever the, the, the industry is, and so many people take this maxim, custom has the weight of law, in that narrow sense of that, you know, in helping interpret contracts and in, in helping fill in contractual terms, uh, things like that. Maybe prior usage by the parties as well could be could be a yes. subtext, sub, sub, 
you know, example of that. But, um, you know, I, I personally believe that, uh, you know, uh, custom should be seen more broadly as, as, you know, sort of, um, ex you know, uh, uh, practical, uh, practical lived experience, kind of like what you were just saying, um, you know, and, uh, you know, just as a practical matter, living in the world, we come to know of certain things, we come to be aware of certain things. And uh, through our experience, um, we should become aware of these things. And these things should influence how we understand the law. And so, yeah, certainly, I, I don't think there is any um, direct constitutional basis to uh, uh, justify affirmative action, but I think I agree with your sort of broader interpretation that you need to look beyond the text as well. And I think in Islamic law, we have that same debate and that same issue. And uh, I think we often have to look beyond the law as well. And and some of the uh, maxims help do that. Custom is the uh, has the weight of law as one example. Another example is, um, you know, harm shall be removed. Uh, you know, when you see discrimination, when you see uh, economic inequality, um, that's a maxim. There's no, there's no Quranic uh, direct um, or in the hadith, in the example and, and the life of the Prophet, uh, peace and blessings be upon him, any direct example of like, you know, that uh, people should have equal opportunity at a job or something like that. But general notions of human equality need to play out in in the society. And if they're not, there's a role for law and a role for policy and a role for the government to, to step into that. So that's an interesting text versus extra textual. I think you got that tension both in the Constitution as well yeah. as um, in the United States, in the, in the Islamic tradition. Um, you know, you, you remind me very much in, in your mention of experience being so important to how we uh, meet out justice and 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 apply our laws. Uh, it reminds me so much of the of a oft quoted phrase by an early 20th century justice of the U.S. Supreme Court named Oliver Wendell Holmes in a book called The Common Law. He said, "The life of the law has not been logic, but experience." Uh, mm. The idea being, logic and reasoning only takes you so far. What really matters in the way the law functions and it, it's in its proper functioning is to take into account custom, as you say, experience, what works, what doesn't. I'm not entirely sure how much I agree with that because I'm a big fan of reason and logic. And experience tends to become situational and, uh, and, and lessons are learned from it according to the particular person who has had the experience. And I get a little nervous when judges stray from strict reasoning to what I call result-oriented uh, decision-making, to reaching what they think is the right result based on their experience, because everyone's experience differs. And even if you, if you interpret experience in this context as being the experience of judges, of the, the, the uh, community of judges over the years, decades, and even centuries, is still reflective of who ends up becoming judges, what, what their experience is. And there is frequently a big gap between the experience of poor people, of oppressed people, uh, from the experience of judges, who generally tend to come from the the winners in the uh, battle of societies, <laughs> in the battles yeah. within our societies. Yeah. So, so um, I mean, we have all these traditions in in the U.S. U.S. constitutional and uh, equitable thought. I there's a, some more maxims of equity I can quote to you, which all sound very wonderful. Um, one must, this is in California Civil Code Section 3514, one must so use his own rights as not to infringe upon the rights of another. Sounds great. No one should suffer by the act of another. No man is responsible for that 
which no man can control. These are three mm. different uh, sections in the civil code. And then the one I, read, I mentioned earlier, for every wrong, this is a remedy. This all sounds very familiar, doesn't it? It sounds like you can find uh, these expressions of notions of justice, I imagine, in the Quran, in the Talmud, mm-hmm. in the writings of Augustine, and throughout the Abrahamic faith, in Buddhism, yeah. I'm sure in Hinduism, everywhere. They, they make their way into the law of this country, and why is that? It's because the law of this country arrives from, it, 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 it has devolved from religious traditions, because at some point in all of our histories, there was no division between law and between religion and the state. And in, in America now, at least, and in, in, in most of Europe, there is a division, in fact, more so, say, in France uh, than in the U.S. But uh, law and religion are divided, and yet they can't be, because our law is rooted in religious values. It's rooted in ethical values of notions of justice. And ultimately, I think, all of the world's great religions seek to mete out justice. Now, where things tend to fall apart is in the, in the efforts of human beings to figure out what justice means. So yeah. That's a tough one. Well, no, I, I think it's interesting you raised the issue of custom. You know, I, I think that's where um, I would agree with you. Uh, I don't see custom sometimes makes no sense. Uh, mm. The way people have been doing things often doesn't make any sense. And so, um, you know, custom as defined in Islamic law is, is, is and again, definitions are always tricky, right? I mean, who's mm-hmm. reasonable and who's like, the reasonable person, you know? I mean, how do you define these things? But I, but I think uh, we have nothing but words to use to define things. And so just like the use of the term justice itself, you know, we're forced to end up using ambiguous terms, but I think they um, help to define or narrow or at least exclude some cases where that, that are clearly the opposite of that. So in the case of custom, you know, uh, custom is, is, is technically defined in Islamic law as that which is reasonable to, to, uh, to people of, of proper disposition. Uh, which you know, as could you could you could poke at how that has a problematicness to it. But I think custom needs to be linked to reason. Uh, custom can't just be experience on its own or how we've always done things or, or or, um, uh, you know, just just the way things are type of thing. Because then exactly status quo is you know status quo is custom and status quo can be unjust um, in many cases. And so there needs to be a reasonableness. Um, how about tapping into, I think, something else that also is some of the some of your interest uh, in and in some of the work you do, empathy and justice. Mm. You know, where where does empathy and 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 you know justice come in? And it's kind of you know we often talk about uh, in criminal law, for example, um, you know, mitigating and aggravating circumstances when you, someone's found guilty now and hopefully that was a just process with due process and everything. Um, but after having been found guilty now, we need to def- def- decide how much to punish the person. You know, mitigating circumstances or aggravating circumstances might make us to give a lesser punishment or a, a higher punishment. I think often we... Um, envision that as, and maybe it's not the right way to envision it, but I think it's often envisioned as a way of having empathy with a particularly sympathetic, you know, defendant who uh, acted as a result of um, maybe not totally circumstances out of his control, as you were saying, because in that case, the person probably should not have been found guilty, but circumstances that made it, you know, less likely for them to be, to be a citizen capable of of living up to the expectations of the law, um, poverty, you know, uh, things like that. Um, uh, and you know, we generally see that as being just, um, empathy. So having empathy, but then some, sometimes, you know, we, some wrongdoers, we don't have empathy with them. Um, you know, Walmart in the, uh, gender discrimination lawsuits that Walmart has had to face over the years. I mean, I think there've been many of them. Um, you know, uh, obviously the management, they're people, they're, they're human beings, they're fallible human beings, just like 
the 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 poor kid who stole or who did whatever who we typically would say we ought to empathize with to be just um they're also fallible human beings who do to profit motives or whatever different kind of motives uh, certain structural things you know kind of cause them to act in certain ways we never hear and and i'm not saying this is problematic you know uh and we can talk about whether it's problematic or not but um we never hear anybody about saying you know, let's be empathetic with Walmart or with, with something. So, so where does empathy play with justice? And you know, what are the limits of empathy? Or does empathy have uh, guidelines around who? And can we even t have this discussion without some kind of ethical principles about who's the empathetic, who's to have empathy, who deserves our empathy, and who doesn't deserve our empathy? Are, are those part you know bundled up in there? Mm -hmm. Well, empathy is a politically charged word in the American legal community these days. And you can look back to the confirmation hearings of Sonia Sotomayor for yeah, the yeah. U.S. Supreme Court in 2009, yeah. I believe it was, uh, where during her hearing, uh, some conservative senators brought up the notion of empathy and how they believed it has no role to play whatsoever in, uh, in appellate judging in application of the law. Um, Justice John Roberts has famously, has famously said the role of a judge is to call balls and strikes, to be an umpire, and that's it. And empathy, he hasn't said this specifically, but it underlies his, his view of the role of a judge. Empathy has nothing to do with it, has no role to play. Sonia Sotomayor would say quite to the contrary, did say, uh, which caused her so much grief in her uh, confirmation hearings that empathy is very important to the administration of justice. Now, what comes to mind when you bring up the subject of empathy are three related notions, empathy, compassion, and mercy. Uh, empathy is the ability to see things from somebody else's perspective, to understand, for example, why the child molester became a child molester Maybe it had something to do with the fact that that person as a child was molested. Compassion is the idea of acting on the empathy you feel for somebody. Having empathy itself is neutral in a way. It's just being able to see from that person's perspective. Compassion is more active and then it's acting on that empathy to, to do something to alleviate suffering, for example. Mercy is a different thing yet is the notion of forgiveness in the, uh, in the, as part of the act of compassion. Uh, certainly the law recognizes mercy. Uh, I mean, it, it, mercy is a fundamental notion of any system of religion as well as American law, Anglo-American law. Uh, empathy, the ability to take the perspective of another uh, isn't that essential to having compassion? If you yeah. don't have empathy, if you can't see things from another person's perspective, it sort of hobbles your ability to uh, show compassion for that person or to show mercy for that person. So I think empathy does have a role to play. But, but it's it, interesting. There's a bit of a tension in some of the comments you made with respect to the custom uh, around things have to be reasoned uh, because different people have different yeah. experiences. And so I, I don't like fuzzy things like, you know, that will, um, uh, that could cause a judge to, to um, uh, make a decision in a certain way that's based on their experience. And yes. now we want to bring in empathy, which I think is not the opposite of reason per se, um, but, uh, you know, th there's a bit of a tension there between sort of like something like empathy and I think the idea that decisions should be reasoned and, and, and have, have a basis in law. Uh, is, do you feel there's a tension there or how do you oh, yes. that tension? Oh, yes. I mean, a, a judge who made his or her way into the ranks of the judiciary by through being a corporate litigator, for example, who spent the earlier part of their career defending corporations and uh, enabling them to do what corporations are intended to do, which is to make money for their shareholders. They might actually have empathy for Walmart. <laughs> they might look at yeah. it and say, Walmart 
Yeah, well, Mar- I don't think Walmart's a corporation, actually. I think they're family held, but just no, imagine family held, that, but I'm sure it's a corporation, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, imagine that the, the, the purpose of a corporation is to make money, period. Yeah. Uh, legally speaking, they don't have any obligation to have empathy or to have compassion or to give alms to the poor. Uh, but... Uh, that's that's the job of the legislature to pass yeah. laws to force them to do that. Yeah. So I can, I can yeah. definitely envision a judge. In fact, there are probably several judges on the U.S. Supreme Court right now who felt great empathy for Walmart in being uh, stalked by these evil plaintiffs, personal injury lawyers who were trying to make money and nothing else as they see it. And all Walmart was doing was trying to run a business and make money. And if discrimination against women as part of that, so be it. That's the nature of the business world. So, yeah, that's the danger in making empathy uh, in recognizing it as a you know fundamental part of judging. What does empathy mean? Who's empathy? Uh, that's a really tough one. I think the best way of dealing with that is to have a diverse bench so that we don't have uh, the federal and state judiciary having come exclusively from the ranks of corporate lawyers. Uh, yeah. Corporate lawyers have their place, but there should be criminal defense lawyers, there should be former prosecutors, personal injury lawyers, family law lawyers. So that ultimately the bench is populated by people who have had a, a broad array of experience uh, within their own lives, within the way they practiced law when they were lawyers, so that in the overall collegial application of the law to given cases that come before the courts, by and large, the system will work well. It's always going to fall down in individual cases. There's always going to be failures. But with a sufficiently diverse bench, uh, and I mean diversity in every way, geographic, racial, uh, economic. Um, Socioeconomic, yeah, background. Yes, yeah. in every way maximizes the potential for meeting out uh, justice as most people could conceive of it. Um, I think in California, for example, we have a very diverse bench right now, and uh, it's taken a a long time to get there, but uh, compare it with the U.S. Supreme Court, which has some racial and ethnic diversity, but every single one of those judges went to either Harvard or Yale Law School, yeah. uh, which are really good law schools, but um, it would be nice to see someone who's come from the ranks of something else, <laughs> yeah. some other yeah. law, some other part of the country. So we have one from the West, Anthony Kennedy. But yeah, it's a real tough one. We can talk about empathy all we want about how important it is. It's a lot easier for me to... Uh, deal with the question of empathy as a practitioner than as a judge, because as a practitioner, I don't have to decide ultimately how the case goes. Um, And I often find myself representing people who I don't really um, like all that much or who I don't think are great role models or who I think have done something bad, but they need a defense they need legal representation for some special reason, and I need to look beyond uh, their particular circumstances if I'm aiming to achieve a broader objective in my litigation. There's this wonderful quote from a book called Just Mercy, written by a man named Brian Stevenson. It came out a few years ago. Uh, he does death penalty uh, defense across the country. This is in the very last page of the book. He says this, mercy, he's talking about mercy and compassion. Mercy is just when it is rooted in hopefulness and is freely given. Mercy is most empowering, liberating, and transformative when it is directed at the undeserving. The people who haven't earned it, who haven't even sought it, are the most meaningful recipients of our compassion. I think that's beautifully put. It's easier for me to follow that dictum as a practitioner because I'm ultimately not the decision maker. I would like to see judges follow that dictum, but I recognize that it can be very difficult. 
not only difficult, but, you know, um, potentially problematic, just like you were saying. Uh, mm -hmm. The people who don't deserve it, well, does Walmart deserve, you know? Um, and th did Walmart ask and does Walmart deserve? I mean, I think, I think it seems to me that um, ethics and uh, who's ultimately right or wrong in a case um, need to be a part of, of you know, who deserve. I mean, there, I think there needs to be discrimination on who gets the empathy. Um, and I think without a moral or ethical compass, and I, you know, I don't know how to articulate that, you know, uh, exactly but um it, it 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 as a part of that discourse or as a part of that conversation it just seems to me difficult because at the end of the day you have to choose one or as a judge maybe as a practitioner your job is to make your um you know the person you're representing in court to be as empathetic as you know to get, to be someone who uh, that the court can sympathize with as much as possible but as a judge certainly uh, where your empathy should be it seems to me that without some uh broader thing, uh, broader ethical uh, framework, it would be difficult to dispense, uh, you know, the, just the person who deserves it the least just strikes me as he did not intend Walmart. Um, and no. he never, he never, he never remotely intended Walmart. So it's kind of interesting. Um, uh, well, with that, I think, uh, you know, we'll, we'll probably I wrap the, the wrap up the conversation. Thank you so much for your time, and this was really enlightening. Very interesting, indeed. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.